The honorary degree will now be conferred. I invite Dr. Ann Salomon to present the honorary degree candidate, Dr. C.S. Buzz Holling. Dr. Salomon is a Hakai professor at the School of Resource and Environmental Management and acting director of the Hakai Network for Coastal People, Ecosystems, and Management. Dr. Salomon. Madam Chancellor, discovering solutions to the world's environmental problems is among the central challenges of our time. Fortunately, we're well poised to confront these challenges, thanks in large part to Dr. C.S. Buzz Holling, one of the most influential Canadian scientists of this century. A renegade ecologist with a contrarian approach Dr. Holling has literally transformed the way we think about the environment that sustains us and the welfare of society. Dr. Holling's pioneering research has helped lay the very foundations of modern ecology. He introduced the concept of resilience in ecological systems to describe their ability to resist and to recover from natural and human-made disturbances. This body of research has fundamentally reshaped our understanding of the dynamics of ecological systems. And almost four decades later, the rich legacy of this work informs contemporary discussions and debates over nonlinear systems, tipping points, and adaptation to global change. As the author of several highly influential books and papers, Dr. Holling helped stimulate a new paradigm for natural resource management, one that explicitly recognizes an, our uncertainty in ecological systems. His work has highlighted the pathology of command and control approaches to resource management, where well-intentioned policies can often have unintended consequences. Dr. Holling was one of the first ecologists to recognize the strong connection between ecological and social systems, arguing that we need to analyze and understand these systems as components of a single larger whole. This integrative thinking has illuminated our understanding of the growth, the collapse, and the regeneration of coupled human ecological systems. Dr. Holling's work has not only been transformative in the ecological sciences, but it has penetrated and catalyzed many other disciplines, including the field of ecological economics. As director of the Institute of Animal Resource Ecology at UBC and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna, Dr. Holling has a long history of fostering novel and cross-disciplinary collaborations. While his contributions have been recognized with many prestigious honors, including the Order of Canada, the magnitude of his influence is perhaps best measured by the collective impact of students, researchers, and practitioners that have been profoundly influenced by his work. So today, we pay tribute to a luminary and a renegade whose lifetime of work will help us solve some of the biggest environmental problems facing our planet. Madam Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of this university, I ask that you confer upon Dr. C.S. Buzz Holling the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Buzz Holling, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Dr. Holling will be hooded by Dr. Bill Crane, Associate Vice President Academic, and Dr. Kate Ross, Registrar.
you have a little signing to do, and then I'll introduce you for your address. Right over here. Congratulations. <laughs> address we just put it right here thanks a lot <laughs> good job Ready to go? Here we go. It is a great pleasure that I now call on Dr. Buzz Holling for his convocation address. Dr. Holling. Thank you. This holds the talk down from the wind that is going to blow it away otherwise. Um, Madam Chancellor, uh, Mr. President. It is a great honor to me to accept this honorary degree. It speaks well to the warmth and the sense of community that we've experienced, friends and relatives, since we arrived yesterday. And my remarks right now are directed to the people that are graduating. Uh, 60 years ago, I was in the same place you are now, but at the University of Toronto. By the time I got my PhD, can you hear me? Uh -huh. By the time I got my, ah. Is that better? By the time I got my PhD, uh, some uh, eight, six or eight years later, uh, I was well launched on the goal that I had set myself to simply understand population processes. The motivation was really driven just by sort of simple, raw curiosity. Funny events, strange events, in, particularly in nature, would grab my attention and trigger some puzzlement and thought and eventual hypotheses and experiments that gradually opened the world to me. I felt really like an explorer, uh, not only exploring new territory, but new territory that had been created by the discoveries I'd made I had a particularly over, overarching goal to try to understand the way these processes operated in, with precision and realism and holism and in a way that was rooted in reality. At the time, the computers were not quite available. They came in sort of the mid-50s. But the experimental work uh, really used different organisms to answer different questions. It ended up praying mantis, uh, owls, uh, shrews, deer mice, birds, 
stocking lions in Africa, all became part of the ensemble that helped answer some of these questions uh, of, uh, concerning predation and predator-prey interactions. Then when the computer came along, suddenly, the language of Fortran, one of the early computer languages, suddenly seemed to have been designed to handle the very critical parts of what I had been discovering experimentally, thresholds and limits and what have you. Uh, it led eventually to the point where we invented and discovered resilience. Resilience comes from understanding that systems don't exist in an entirely stable state. The myth at the time was, yes, indeed, that's the way the world was structured. But in fact, there are multiple stable regions. And what's more important than the stability conditions is the instability conditions. Understanding those has become more and more evident. We could have predicted, for example, the cod collapse on the uh, eastern, uh, off Newfoundland, some decades ago, before it occurred and had done something about it. And yet it occurred and destroyed and changed dramatically the social and economic livelihood of communities in Newfoundland. A similar example of reaching a critical crisis point has been the lodgepole pine beetle outbreaks in this part of the world and throughout British Columbia and even into Alberta. The same sudden appearance of a, of a surprise, an unexpected event. The roots of both those surprises, both those crises, are traced to slow phenomena occurring unconsciously and unaware. You and we have a great ability to deal with fast events, immediate events. We are less visionary in dealing with those slow events that accumulate from the consequences of our fast actions. But it's those slow events that invisibly increase the fragility, the loss of resilience of the systems we live in and depend upon. It's forced a new paradigm, a new paradigm that's led to these theories of resilience, to adaptive complex systems, to integration across scales from the mouths of rivers on the west coast here right up to the Arctic, from the small and fast to the slow and the big, from needles on trees functioning over days and months to the whole boreal forest over millennia and to management of resources that is adaptive. That's all part of complex adaptive systems theory. It reflects humanity's partial knowledge and the fast inventions that deal with these and generate these surprises. We're now living at a time when those surprises and those collapses have emerged on a global scale. They have been the financial collapses, collapses in banks. There's the deep structural problems in Europe and political problems in Europe, in the United States, and inevitably emerging in Canada as well deep crises as a consequence of the slow buildup of instabilities. We're living in a system since the Berlin Wall fell, really, that has become more and more vulnerable because of the accumulation of the fast successes. So that's where we are now. It's a turbulent time for you all. But you and I have a real purpose in this turbulent time. We need to minimize 
there's two classes of things we need to do. You need to do, first of all, the difficult job of minimizing the slow spread in the face of lobbies who insist on doing things the way they did before. You, every time you open a newspaper, you'll see some utterly stupid set of resistances from, the, from corporations, often, to the elimination and control of some of these forces of instability. We have to do the best we can to fight against those lobbies and to open up a little bit of space for the other active thing that young people can do. So on one hand, we have to focus on keep trying, keep talking, keep discussing, keep communicating, but recognize it is a frustratingly slow process, that part of the resolution or solutions. When you do it, understand there are traps. There are poverty traps, like Haiti is an example. There are rigidity traps. Fascism is a classic example of a, uh, of a rigidity trap that we destroyed. There are lock-in traps that I often see in mega agriculture. And there are gilded traps that come from the subsidies made to certain resource exploitations. To deal with those, you, and I too, need to encourage and support experiments. A bold new entrepreneurial gestures, efforts, experiments to develop a different kind of world that recognizes the enduring nature of slow variables in our society, in our culture, in our sciences, in our education. The existence of the internet makes it suddenly possible for those experiments originated in a small group here perhaps to can connect to related experiments in Sweden, in South Africa, in Europe, in other parts of Canada and the US as a collegium of global experimentation driven by the enterprise of young people like you. Many of those experiments will fail. That's what experiments are about. You learn when something fails. But a few will succeed. And you need then to search for those few successes that will synergize between them to propagate a new phase in our world. As we begin to, to accumulate the results of those experiments, already ongoing, we've got to begin to encourage nonviolent protest. It's those protests that in our world has really started, I think, with the Arab Spring. They're emerging now in the Occupy Wall Street movement. I'm told that on Saturday, here in Vancouver, an arm of that protest movement, nonviolent but articulate, is emerging in uh, at the Woodward Building at 10 a.m. <laughs> 10 a.m. in at the Woodward Building in Vancouver, there will be a general assembly of quiet, no, noisy, 
but nonviolent protesters. If you have any chance of doing so, go there and contribute to that expression and that voice. Make it a big Arab Spring. Open a new world. Thank you very much.